Many modern gamers know Namco as the company behind games like Tekken, Soul Calibur, and numerous other titles that bear their company logo. I can also remember a time when the Namco name was written across a bunch of Golden Era arcade games that defined my expectations as a small child. It was also Namco that had went head-to-head -head with Sega during the explosion of mainstream Polygon games in the arcade. Truth be told, every memory I have of gaming involves Namco in some way, shape, or form. They were ever-present in the hobby, always with some new game or hardware to blow you away. Even as a die-hard Sega fan, it's easy for me to recognize not just their great lineup of software over the years, but also the importance of their hardware advances and their fierce competition with Sega that drove both companies to innovate at an unprecedented speed and level in the 1990s. In this episode, we will be looking at Namco's rise as a prolific maker of arcade and home games, and ultimately, their showdown with Sega as the two companies redefined what could be achieved with Polygon Gaming. I hope you guys enjoy Namco and the rise of Polygon Games. Namco's history begins not so dissimilar from Sega's. Founded in the 1950s by Masaya Nakamura, their early days were spent making coin-operated mechanical rides and games for department stores under the name Nakamura Manufacturing Company. This went on until the 1970s when the company took a keen interest in video arcade games. Nakamura saw an opening to enter the market when Atari Japan was put up for sale in 1974 which he aggressively pursued as the company's next big step as an entertainment producer. This purchase made Nakamura Manufacturing the leading distributor of Atari arcade games in Japan. This led to a number of fruitful years for Nakamura and his company, distributing hits like Breakout across the nation. Nakamura wanted to actually produce the machine so he could sell more at a larger profit, something Atari was expressly against, yet Nakamura did so anyway. Atari sued him and won the lawsuit, souring the relationship and ultimately changing the landscape of gaming forever. With Nakamura seeing the success of video arcade games and his own endeavors in the market, he changed his company's name to Namco in 1977 and opened branches in Hong Kong in the United States. Nakamura was also keen to begin internal development of new games, and released its first game outside of Japan in 1978 called Shoot Away. But it was the following year in 1979 that it had its first major hit, Galaxian. It took Japan by storm, selling thousands of arcade machines and attracting the attention of Midway Games. Together they made a deal to bring the game to the United States, where it again was a smashing success. This cemented the relationship between the two companies for years, and paved the way for other massive hits like Pac-Man and Galaga. With Namco's games selling so well, even Atari stepped back in to partner with them to distribute their games in North America, with hits like Dig Dug and Pole Position. This all led to a huge amount of success for Namco and a major growth spurt for the company across all regions. They had gone from a small company distributing Atari's games in Japan in 1974 to a major player producing the most successful games in the industry in just five short years. With the ebb and flow of the arcade business in the 1980s, Namco recognized that it needed to diversify further and became one of Nintendo's first third-party developers for the Famicom in Japan. This led to another big boom for their finances thanks to hits like Xevious, which sold a few million copies in Asia alone. Namco also continued to produce hit arcade games in the mid-1980s like Rolling Thunder, which allowed their branding a strong association with quality titles. The company grew, the money rolled in, and Namco was ready to move forward again with investment in new technologies. It was decided that while they were seeing success with traditional 2D graphics at the time, the future would be much more complicated. They had already faced major competition from Sega in and out of Japan, particularly when it came to sprite scaling games, and Namco felt it was falling behind. 
not one to sit around and wait to see what the other guy was up to, they began developing a platform that would take gaming into an entirely new era. An era defined by 3D polygons. Namco began pumping big money into polygon research and development in the mid-1980s. That work would eventually become known as the Polygonizer, or the Namco System 21. Namco was not the first to use polygons in a video game, but they were the first to create a platform that accelerated polygons just for a video game. That title was Winning Run, and after three exhaustive years in development, Namco finally had their next generation showpiece for Japan in December of 1988. Running an impressive 60,000 polygons per second, it was a technical marvel compared to the other racing games on the market. It wasn't just the polygons that made it special, as Namco also created a moving arcade cabinet to add to the overall realism of the experience. Namco even created an ability to link machines together so you could play them with multiple players. The Polygonizer would go on to see a few more important releases. Starblade was an on-rail space shooter that blew arcade fans away in 1991, and Air Combat was a flight sim that put you in the seat of jet fighters and running missions in an incredibly realistic cabinet. By the time the later stuff like Cyber Sledge showed up in 1993, the Polygonizer had been upgraded significantly to run faster and more efficiently. Interestingly enough, since Namco had been partnered with Atari at the time, the technology that powered games like Hard Driving and Steel Talons had been derived from the early prototypes of the Polygonizer. Namco's hardware was more capable and evolved much further over the years than the work Atari had released. Alas, after four years on the market and a number of revisions, the Namco System 21 was a mess of custom chips and was expensive to produce. With Sega putting up incredible competition with the Model 1 in 1992, it was time for Namco to move forward yet again. Prepare for Operation Starblade. Calling Starfighter to Geosword. Calling Geosword. Come in, Geosword. The enemy task force, mechanized planet Red Eye, just reached the Federation of Planets and is approaching our mother planet. Our strategy is to neutralize Red Eye. Recognizing the need to keep innovation high, Namco reached out to Evans & Sutherland, a company that produced simulation hardware for the military, to help create the Namco System 22. With a prototype in hand, Namco released SimDrive in 1992, which was essentially an earlier version of Ridge Racer that used a full-size car and panoramic screen. With the technology tested in the public and pressed, it rolled out the System 22 worldwide in 1993. The significance of this release was just as important as the System 21. While that platform was the arcade's first dedicated polygon hardware, the System 22 was the arcade's first dedicated texture mapping polygon hardware. Namco had an instant hit on their hands and Ridge Racer was the talk of the gaming world. Right around the same time as Namco debuted Ridge Racer, Sega had been hard at work on similar technology powering its Model 2 platform and Daytona USA had already been shown off in limited releases around Japan. The competition was going to be fierce, so Namco bumped up development for its new technology and began to release games in an effort to combat Sega at every turn. This wasn't just about pretty 3D graphics on the screen either, it was about being the number one arcade manufacturer in the world, so they went full force with elaborate cabinets that featured massive screens, realistic cars with working instruments and moving parts, and making sure each and every release was something the gaming press would talk about. Intent on keeping the competition on its heels, Namco released an upgrade to the platform called the Super System 22, which featured improved polygon rendering. For the next three years, Namco released numerous racing games like Ace Driver, Rave Racer, and Dirt Dash, and made sure it had answers to everything Sega was doing with a list of software that included Time Crisis, Alpine Racer, and Tokyo Wars. Namco had performed exceptionally well during this time, but its management recognized the futility of competition based on cutting-edge technology and decided it was time to switch gears and focus on quality software and higher profits.
In 1994, recognizing the rising cost of arcade machines and its new relationship with Sony, Namco developed a new platform based on the Sony PlayStation, the Namco System 11. This machine was vastly inferior to the System 22, but was significantly cheaper to produce and had a much higher profit margin. Needing an answer to Sega's Virtua Fighter series, Namco released Tekken in the arcades in 1994. Fully expecting to capitalize on bringing it home 100% intact the following year. This tactic worked brilliantly for Namco. Not only was Tekken a hit financially, but it was proof that great game design didn't need expensive hardware to sell well in the arcade. Namco doubled down on this idea and began releasing more games for the platform. First its big hits would hit the arcade on the System 11 to generate buzz, and then it came home to stellar sales. Games like Soul Edge, Tekken 2, and Point Blank 2 all made spectacular showings. Namco also ported many of its System 22 arcade games to the Sony PlayStation with impressive results, giving the company a massive boost in profits at a time when its main competitor was still relying on high-end arcade hardware to drive its success. Still going strong with its System 11, Namco wanted to add a little more oomph to their arcade games again, and released the Namco System 12 in 1997. This board was again based on the Sony PlayStation, but this time its R3000A CPU was much higher clocked, resulting in better overall performance. There would be numerous games that would use this arcade platform, including Tekken 3, Soul Calibur, and Tekken Tag Tournament. The idea here had been as simple and as brilliant as before. This new platform was still cheaper to produce than the custom high-end stuff it had been competing with Sega with, and they could still bring home ports that still looked and played close enough to make fans happy. Namco had bet on its ability to design great games versus fighting an unwinnable battle of being first to the market with killer hardware, and it had paid dividends in both profits and name recognition. While they did continue custom hardware in the late 1990s with platforms like the Namco System 23, they mostly stayed producing their biggest hit arcade games on platforms based on someone else's technology. This included Sega's Naomi, the PlayStation 2 based Namco System 246 and System 256, and the Xbox based Chihiro. Times were a changing, and Namco was willing to change with them. With the worldwide arcade market shrinking at an alarming rate, Namco began to focus heavily on home development, growing its brands and publishing other companies' games, and spreading out to as many platforms as was profitable. In 2003, Namco began talks to merge with Sega. Sega had also been considered by Sammy for a merger, and for months Namco attempted to stop this. Namco had been expressly interested in Sega's IPs, and since the Sammy Corporation had been a direct competitor, especially in Japan, Namco did not want to see two of its biggest rivals join forces against it. Alas, despite their work, Sammy obtained a controlling interest in Sega, and the two formed the new Sega Sammy Holdings the following year. In 2005, Bandai sought to purchase Namco and merge its assets into one brand. That takeover was finalized later that year, and Bandai Namco Holdings was formed. Today, Bandai Namco continues to release arcade and home games across many platforms, some of which are some of the best-selling games at the time of their launch. Popular Namco series like Tekken and Soul Calibur continue to endure, and Bandai Namco is a major publisher of other companies' games as well.
One thing about Namco that stands in stark contrast to how things went for Sega is that Namco was never tied to home hardware the same way. While Sega had to contend with its systems having varying success across the world's markets, Namco simply developed for whatever was selling best at the time. Couple that with their willingness to stay fluid in the arcade market and focus on profitability, it's no wonder that they had the success that they did. You also can't deny Namco's contribution to the rise of Polygon Gaming. The System 21 saw its first commercial release in 1988, years before Sega had the Model 1 up and running, and even longer before we saw dedicated Polygon rendering consoles and PC hardware at home. There was a stretch of time in the 1990s where Namco was every bit on the same level as Sega when it came to arcade technology and their drive to put out incredible software. It was a constant back and forth of great games that pretty much covered the entire decade with nothing but impressive games to play, both at home and the arcade. Namco's arcade division had pushed Sega to be at its best, and I don't think things would have been the same with the Model 1, 2, and 3 if that rivalry had not been so fierce. They were two companies fighting to be the very best at what they did, and neither was willing to give any ground when it came to quality titles. I have no trouble at all admitting it. Namco was just as good as Sega in many respects during its competitive days, and my childhood wouldn't have had it any other way. I'm Sega Lord X. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.